So today we're going to be starting our look at Ezekiel 22. And if you were uh, the betting types of people, you could say, I wonder if I should put my money on this chapter being about judgment. And you'd be right. This is another judgment chapter. And uh, before we look at Ezekiel 22, please join me again in prayer. Uh, Father, help us to have a love, a deep, abiding love for your word. Let it excite us. Let it be the thing that we love to be doing the most, is being in your word, talking about your word, and living out your word. Turn us into people like that, and if you're already doing that, then deepen those things in us. Help us today as we study your word to be moved by it, convicted by it, encouraged by it, strengthened by it. Use your word to fashion and make us, sanctifying us into Christ-likeness, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Ezekiel 22, this is a judgment coming upon Israel. This is the, going to be talking about the corruption of Israel and its leaders and the judgment that's coming upon it because of this. And we'll uh, unpack this more as we begin, but let us begin in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, so Ezekiel had the word of the Lord come to him. So God is telling him, this is what you're going to say. So this isn't Ezekiel's thoughts and feelings. This is Ezekiel speaking out what the Lord tells him to say. And you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Then declare to her all her abominations. You shall say, thus says the Lord God, a city that sheds blood in her midst so that her time may come and that makes idols to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood that you have shed and have defiled by the idols that you have made and you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the countries. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. This is, even though this is talking about people from a long time ago, you can learn and take something from this. And if you take nothing else from this, the seriousness of sin and the surety of God's judgment upon sin. If you remember nothing else, you remember that. That these chapters talk about the seriousness of sin and also the surety of God's judgment upon sin. So that if you're weeks, months, years from now hearing somebody talking about how, look, there is no hell. Look, there's no, God's going to give a second chance. In the end, God's going to save everybody. There's no judgment. This isn't, no, you correct them. God's a God of love. He would never do this. You correct them and you remember what we see in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is is one of those books that has Uh, a fine combination of the seriousness of sin and the surety of God's judgment upon sin, as well as the hope. The hope that you can have when you throw yourself upon the mercy of the Lord and and say, Lord, save me a sinner. Especially pointed out in Ezekiel 36, from the turning of a heart of stone to the turning to a heart of flesh. And how God will save some for his sake. It's a wonderful book that includes all those things. And all those things are just as true today as they were back then at this writing. So God tells Ezekiel, will you judge the bloody city? Will you judge the bloody city? He's he's doubling up on it to show the intensity of the judgment. Not only the intensity of the judgment, but the intensity of the sinfulness. If God repeats something, it's to imply and to show the intensity of it. So pronounce judgment on Jerusalem, Ezekiel, for it is a bloody city. Many sins have been committed inside of it. Many injustices, much death, much violence, much blood in the eyes of God, which is why he calls it a bloody city. The killing of children, 
the rebelling against Babylon and the rebelling against God, the idea here is not necessarily to say that Jerusalem is more bloody than a pagan city is, but the idea here is to say that in God's eyes, its sins were far worse because they had the revealed word of God at the time. They knew God. They had the prophets. They had the history. And yet in spite of that, in spite of being held to a higher standard because of that, they still sinned against the Lord anyway. So now Jerusalem, which was once known as the holy city, which was once known as a beautiful city, in God's eyes, he refers to it as the bloody city. Oh, how it has fallen. Many, many sinful crimes against God. Many sinful crimes against human life. Many deeds of violence. An awful, awful place. This is what happens when sin is unchecked. This is what happens when sin is unchecked. There is no ability to stop sin at just so far. You cannot say to sin, you can only go thus far and no further. God can. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, you are now victorious over sin or can be victorious over sin, right? In your own personal lives and in the lives of a nation, if you have enough individuals who are saved, you can have a a turnaround in an entire nation. But the idea here is that, look, Sin has gone unchecked. Idolatry has gone unchecked. And idolatry is putting anything above the Lord. Any person, anything that you put above the Lord or put more faith and trust in than the Lord or desire more than the Lord is idolatry. And we're really good at idolatry. We're so good at it that we can have a whole bunch of things that are idols to us and we won't even call them that. That's how good we are about fooling ourselves with idols in our lives and idolatry in our lives. The idea here is that you cannot, if you don't check sin, it will bring everything down. Look at how the people of Israel and Jerusalem and Judah, they did not check sin and what happens? Everything comes down. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. They try and do everything in their own, what is right in their own eyes and everything goes kaput. Everything falls apart. And this is the natural way of things in the world when sin is left unchecked. That goes for a country or a nation, and it goes in our individual lives too. Show her all her abominations. Talk about, list some of these offenses. List some of these many sins. (coughs) This gross idolatry. Ezekiel says she makes idols within herself and defiles herself. Defiled by their unfaithfulness to God, as well as the immoral practices that were going on, the worship of pagan gods, and everything else. This isn't just talking about murder. This isn't just talking about bloodshed in that sense. It's talking about all the sinfulness All the sinfulness that, yes, sin can lead to murder and bloodshed, physically speaking, but sinfulness can lead to the point where you are doing self-harm, causing yourself to spiritually be bloodied. You have caused your days to draw near. That's just saying judgment is coming, and you have caused judgment to come. You've caused judgment to come and your sinfulness and the depths of your sinfulness has caused it to come even quicker. And it's your fault, not God's. That's what God is saying there. Eventually, all your sins will catch up to you. That's what God is saying. And he's saying to this this crowd through Ezekiel that that time has come. Your sins as a nation have caught up to you. And because of this, those who are near to you and those who are far from you will mock you. You'll be full of tumult. You won't get sympathy from these other nations. They won't say, oh, poor Jerusalem, poor Israel. 
They're going to be a reproach. They're going to be a cautionary tale. They're going, to, they're going to be made fun of. They're going to be mocked by all these other countries. So, do you get the idea? I mean, look, we're in Ezekiel 22. We've gotten through almost 22 chapters of Ezekiel. Have you seen any prophet to sin? Have you seen any? I mean, that's, that's the idea here. Sin profits a, a person nothing. And it profits a nation nothing. It only brings destruction, judgment, damage, hurt, pain. That's all it brings. We somehow forget this. Of course, the unbelieving world doesn't know this, doesn't accept it, and won't. of course they think that way, right? <clears throat> but even we who have heard and seen the word of God. Even we can forget this. So, yeah, it's good for us to go through this. Yeah, it's good for us to be reminded of, of just how serious God takes sin. It, again, we, 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 just, we just don't grasp it in the way it should be grasped. This is, this is something that, that we have to strive at, right? You, you have to strive to maintain having the mindset of the seriousness of sin and the gravity of sin and, and the, how deadly sin is and how every sin carries with it damage, hurt, pain. We have to remember that. It, it's so easy to forget that, especially because we have the promise of God's grace. So, But it's important, though, we glorify God when, when we understand the price of sin because then we understand the seriousness of sin helps us understand the price that he paid for our sins. It only took one sin for Adam and Eve to be cast out of the garden. Just one. That's how seriously God takes sin. And so it's important for us to use this as a, as a tool, not just to, to look back and see what kind of character God has and how God deals with sin and what God's expectations are and what God wants. Yes, that is all extremely important. But it's also important for us to see it in the context of our lives today. Being reminded of the, the, the gravity of sin. Because then we don't play around with it in the same way. I remember the first time that my dad, when he was teaching me about working on electrical devices and, and electricity, the first time he showed me a video of somebody um, touching a circuit and having a, a blown circuit. And this video had one of those test dummies, and he was standing there with his arm on the circuit board. And there was a, a, a circuit flash, and that entire dummy was engulfed in flames. And the entire arm, gone, melted off. You better believe that I had a whole new respect for electricity at that point. A very healthy and, and very good respect for electricity, which you need. Otherwise, guess what? You're going to be going, fooling around, you know. Well, let me see what's in that outlet. Hey, let me stick that knife in that outlet and see what happens. If you, you don't, if you don't understand the danger, you're going to handle it in a way that's unsafe, right? But when you understand the danger... Even as believers, sin separates us from a closeness with God. Sin, as, as a believer, even though your sin is covered by the grace of God and there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, yes, that's spiritually speaking, absolutely. But even sin in a believer's life can bring temporal consequences and it can, it can bring us further away from God instead of closer to Him. And it can have a negative effect on people around us or on our testimony or on our witness. So there's a danger to sin. And when you see how God treats sin in the Old Testament and how he treats sin in the... Don't think that God's different from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Say, oh, God was harsh in the Old Testament, but he's much more loving and acceptable in the New Testament. Just go to the book of Revelation. And you tell me that, that God is not still tough on sin. Now, God is always tough on sin. And when we understand the gravitas of sin then you have a healthy respect for it and will handle it differently, just like the story about electricity. You understand its, its consequences, you will handle it differently. So this is powerful. And we need to know that because we need to be able to have that effect in our own individual lives because 
Look, it, it takes a bunch of individuals to turn a nation around. A nation can't be saved all at once. It's saved by one person at a time, one heart at a time. So we need to understand the seriousness of sin for those reasons. But we also need to understand the seriousness of sin to be able to glorify God all the more for saving us from the ramifications of sin spiritually. Verse 6 in Ezekiel 22. Oh, the many, the many sins. Behold, the princes of Israel in you, every one according to his power, have been bent on shedding blood. Not only are they vicious, but that tells you that they're selfish. What's their bent? It's not on helping people. It's not on glorifying God. It's on shedding blood. Father and mother are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widow are wronged in you. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. There are men in you who slander to shed blood and people in you who eat on the mountains. They commit lewdness in your midst. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You take interest and profit and make gain of your neighbor's extortion. But me you have forgotten, declares the Lord God. That's exactly what happens when the Lord is not remembered. And again, it's in the life of a nation or in the life of an individual. When the Lord is not remembered, then sin ensues. And the longer you go allowing sin to ensue, the harder, the deeper, the more profane the sin becomes. And the more hardened the heart becomes. Look, the princes of Israel, God is rebuking the city, but he's also rebuking actual sinners, beginning with the princes or the leaders of Israel. Instead of using their power in a way that would glorify God, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 10, they're not using their power or position to glorify God. They're using their power violently to be able to self-serve. They're serving themselves, not God. This is, this is evident in a society that has, has, has forgotten God. That's what kind of leaders are found prevalently in such a society. Leaders like that. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger, the sojourner. They have mistreated the fatherless, the widow. Those are who... God's leaders should have been caring for. Israel's leaders should have been taking care of those people, the, the most vulnerable in society. Instead, they use them. They actually have like a, 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 a hatred towards them. They despise them and they use them for their own selfish gain. This is something that you can see repeated again and again and again in human history. When people are acting that way and doing those things, when leaders of a nation are acting that way and doing those things, you know that they are not close to God at all. They are far from Him. Far. The Jewish people back in Exodus 20 were told to take care of their fathers and mothers. They were told to care for the, the weak, to care for the widow, to care for the fatherless orphan. To honor your father and mother in Ephesians 6 comes with that blessing that you, your days might be long in the land. And here in this book, we see that that's not happening. They're not honoring father and mother. So guess what? Are their days long in the land? Nope. Quite, quite few are left. God says, you have despised my holy things. You have profaned my Sabbath. See, look, to, des to despise God's holy things are, is to despise God himself. 
It, when someone takes a Bible and throws it into a urinal in protest, they're not just despising the Bible, they're despising God himself. That's what's happening. The sins of these princes of Israel, the sins of these leaders of Israel, are not just against these people that we listed, the fatherless, the widow, the poor, fathers and mothers. It's not just against them. Their atrocities are, and their sins are against God. And every sin you commit, that's the truth. Every sin that's committed is first and foremost against God. That's why David, when he's calling out, says, Oh, you and you alone I have sinned against, O oh Lord. David got it. David got it. So they're against God himself. When they sin against God, they sin against, or sin against the things of God, they're sinning against God. They were even eating with these false idols on the mountain. God's like, I see you. I see you doing that. You have profaned my Sabbaths. You've, you've, you've done this not just once, but multiple times. That's why it's plural. Nothing could satiate their evil desire. That's why sinfulness, unchecked, just goes worse, worse, worse. That's, that's, that's why it's not good to leave sin unchecked. That's why when God talks about those who are his, his, he says that I correct those I love. He's not correcting, he's not correcting these people, is he? No, because he does not love them. You know who he corrects? His true sons and daughters. That's who he corrects so that they might come back to him. They violate women. They take bribes to shed blood. They take usury fees. So, I mean, this is everywhere. There's a, there's a spiritual sin that's being done, right, with the idolatry. There is the, the physical sin of taking advantage of women. And there's several instances given there. Rape, incest. And now you're taking bribes to shed blood. There's your financial your physical, your financial, your spiritual, all those different ways. So it's just God's way of saying, there is no area of life that you have not perverted in your sinfulness. That's what God's saying. So he's, he's not giving the exhaustive list. He's giving enough of a list so that the reader understands how bad the sinfulness was. So that God can say, look at how bad it was. Oh, it wasn't just in one area. It's in every area. It has permeated everything. And the idea here is, is that it's talking about the leaders of Israel and Judah and Jerusalem, but it's top down. You know, what, what leaders are allowed to do and what leaders do trickles down to the people underneath them. If that's the conduct of the leaders, then it's ex expected that the conduct of the commoner was going to be at least as bad, if not worse. Because what do people think of leaders in, in a nation? Well, those are the cream of the crop. Oh, they're the ones who are, they come from fine families. They know which fork to use to eat an oyster and which fork to use to have salad. They're very, they're very highfalutin, highbrow people. So you would expect the leaders who are supposed to be cut from a, a higher quality cloth, if they're acting this bad, think how bad the commoner is acting. That's the idea. And it's not like one was better than the other. The idea here is to show the extent of the sinfulness of all. But leaders are held to a higher standard. God tells all these people, you've forgotten me. You've forgotten me. All this wickedness. You want to know why all these things are happening? God gives this list. And again, it's not exhaustive, but it's just meant to show the, the grasp, to help you grasp just how awful it was. And God's saying, all of these sins, everything that's happening is because you have forgotten me. You have forgotten me. 
All of this wickedness. The main cause is because you have forgotten me, declares God. When someone forgets God and leaves God's way, it opens them up to every form of wickedness, sin, and abomination. When you forget God, when you turn your back on God, when you go your own way instead of God's way, it leads to sin, wickedness, and abomination. Of course it does. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't take a large stretch of logic, does it? All you have to do is live long enough to, to understand that you're not holy. You're wicked. I'm wicked. Only God is holy. So if you turn from the one source of true holiness and true light, then of course the only other way to go is the opposite direction, which is sinfulness, wickedness, and darkness. Which is why every, every thought, every second of every day matters. Every second of every day matters. This is something I wish the younger me heard. Every second of every day matters. Everything I'm watching, listening to, hearing, every person that I'm spending time with, everything, it all matters because it all is either a step towards God or a step away from Him. It's, that's the truth. And some things can seem innocuous or, or almost just, you know, look, there's nothing really seemingly bad about it, isn't there? This is how we have to start weighing everything. I was telling a friend just recently that, you know, I have to make sure that I'm not spending too much time watching football even. I've even started to take my leisure activity and say, okay, let's not take it too far because I want to make sure that I'm, am I using that time? Sometimes you need leisure. Sometimes you need relaxation. Sometimes you need to be able to take a load off and just, you know, relax because you've had a long day, a rough day, and you need to recharge your batteries a little bit. By doing that, but there's a danger even in that. You don't want that to become the rule of thumb that this is all I do with my spare time, do you? Because the days are evil, so we should make sure that we use our time, and our time is limited, so we should make sure that we use our time well, yes? Or that song I like, well, I know that the, the, the singer isn't that great, but I like the, you know, and I know that some of those lyrics are questionable, but I like the beat. And you can sit there and tell yourself that you're, you know, you're filtering those lyrics. You're just really, what you're really listening to is the beat. But those lyrics are getting through. Those lyrics, you're hearing them. There's an effect. And it's not bringing you closer to God, is it? So that's how we have to start thinking in that sense, is that we have to make sure that we're not forgetting God in the, in the little things of everyday life. Because you're going to all stand before Christ one day. And now there will be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. She's still going to stand before him one day. And so I want to stand before him. And that's how I'm starting to view life that way. That all these little micro moments matter. As far as is it bringing me closer to God or further away? Is it something that's glorifying God? Or is it something that's serving my own self-interest only? God says all these people reading about in Ezekiel have forgotten me. The only restraint that these people had about their wickedness was their ability or inability to do it. In other words, nothing was stopping them except whatever their ability was. This, you know, such a, such a person would go out and rape 25 women if there were 25 women around. Such a person would go out and steal from a thousand families. If they could find a thousand families, you see, that's the idea. That there was nothing reining them in. Their sinfulness had no bounds. They did everything wickedly that they could. The only thing keeping them from doing more was just their ability. Maybe they had a physical limitation, a financial limitation, a mental limitation. That's the only thing that restrained them at all was their ability. Otherwise, if it was wicked, they'd do it. They had no filter. Nothing holding them back. Verse 13. Behold, I strike my hand at the dishonest gain that you have made and at the blood that has been made in your midst. Can, you cur can your courage endure 
Or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. I will scatter you amongst the nations and disperse you through the countries and I will consume your uncleanness out of you. And you shall be profaned by your own doing in the sight of the nations and you shall know that I am the Lord. This is a a very, very strong term. I beat my fist. This, This is saying God hates That's that's what's saying here. God hates this. I beat my fist at the dishonest profit by which you have made, by the bloodshed. All these things that God has listed, he hates it. He hates it. And Ezekiel here is is seeing um, everything that God is doing to punish unfaithful Israel come to pass. He's seen... The, the near prophecy fulfillment of this, and he's seen parts of the far prophecy of this. He's seen God's judgment that's going to be happening in the very near future as he's saying these things, but he's also seen how the Jewish people will be dispersed across the world. And it is all for the sake of purging Israel's sins, it's all corrective is judgmental and corrective. God says, can your heart endure? Can your hands or fists remain strong when I'm the one dealing with you? The idea here is that, that, do you understand who you're up against? Do you understand who you're sinning against? Have you, ever, have you ever been having a conversation with someone and perhaps you're not taking it very seriously and the person goes, I mean what I'm saying. Do you ever have that happen? And it, holy moly, it sets the tone, doesn't it? Stops what you're doing. And you realize all of a sudden very quickly that, oh, this is serious, right? That's exactly what happens. That person pounds the ta- their, ta- their fist on the table and says, I am serious. And you go, oh. Whoa, they really are serious. That's what God's doing here. That's what God is doing here. Pounds his fist. Says, I'm serious. Can you endure? Will your hands remain strong when you are dealing with me? I mean, that's terrifying. If I just read that verse and I don't explain that to you, it almost, it almost just kind of slides by, doesn't it? But when I read it and I explain just that little bit more to it, whew, when you were a kid and you heard your dad's voice raised, you knew something's up. Someone's about to get in trouble. This is, this is what God is doing here. You think you can stand against me when I'm the one that is coming against you in judgment? I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. I will do everything I've said I'm going to do. And then you'll know I am Lord. Not any of these other false gods that you've been worshiping and not even yourself, who is really your one true God, is you yourself. But when I come against you, you will understand that I am the Lord, for I will do everything I've spoken. In the days when I shall deal with you, Remember, God's the swordsman and the Babylonians are his sword. God is saying, just because the Babylonians are coming against you, don't think that you have some kind of a chance. It's really me who's coming against you. And against me, you have no chance. And against me, no one has a chance. I'm going to scatter you, is what God says. I'm not just going to let you be conquered. I'm going to scatter you in exile. And when you sit a joke to the nations, then you will understand that I am the Lord. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. You will know me. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you refuse to know me by my blessing. So now you will acknowledge me through my punishment. This is the idea. The nation 
is going to be saved, this nation that we're hearing about being defiled, and full of wickedness, and sin, and being judged, and being exiled and dispersed, that same nation God is going to restore one day in the future. That same nation will be saved in the future by the same God who is judging it now, who judged it then and who is judging it now. That same nation will be saved in the future. We see that in Zechariah chapters 9 through 14, the punishment and restoration of Israel. The Lord's promised salvation through him who Israel pierced, being Christ Jesus. And through all this that God's doing, he is going to have the idolatry of Israel cut off finally. And then there will be the coming of the day of the Lord. Just to give you some idea here, this is something that's talked about also, not just in Zechariah, but it's also talked about in Romans 11 by Paul. Just a, just a couple of verses to give you a little, just a taste, right? Just to wet your lips a little. This is Romans 11, verses 25 through 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Until the church age is done. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, meaning Israel. And the deliverer who's coming from Zion is no one other than Jesus Christ. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, meaning Israel, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's going to come full circle one day. It's going to come full circle one day. But before that fulfillment of that prophecy, Israel is going to be destroyed, exiled, punished for its idolatry and its wickedness. But God will save for himself a remnant so that his word will be true. The word he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will fulfill. He will make sure that he crosses every T and dots every I. God will make sure that everything he says he would do, he will do. And in order to do that, there will come a day in the future when all of Israel will repent and will have their eyes opened and will accept Christ as Messiah. What a day that will be. Please pray with me as we end there for today. Father, the seriousness of your judgment, let it never be lost on us. Because we who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, have been saved from this judgment. And so seeing and hearing the severity of your judgment on sin makes us highly and acutely aware of what you have saved us from. And we're, we're so grateful, but at the same time, we still have so much folly in our own lives, so much sin, so many things that we still have not yielded over to you, please grasp our hands and pry open our fingers and help us to let go of anything that is not holy in your eyes, anything that is not worthy of you. Please take it from us, pull it from our hands, and replace it with godly things, with things that are truly praiseworthy in your eyes. Help us, Lord, too, as we hear messages like this, to have a sense of urgency in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, to warn others like good watchmen of the danger that sin possesses so that we might call them to repentance and call them to grace and faith and mercy so that they might taste the same grace we have and be spared as we have been spared and that they might be converted, transformed, and changed into people of God whose lives are full of praise and full of work to glorify you. Be with us, Lord, in all these ways, for we ask it in Jesus' name.